Hey everybody and welcome to another edition of Talking Hockey Sense. I'm Chris Peters and this is episode 69 of the podcast. Got a nice podcast for you today. We're really excited to talk about CHL top prospects and a lot of other things. I'm going to be heading out to Langley, British Columbia real soon actually as soon as I'm done recording this podcast essentially and we'll uh, be on site and providing coverage of the CHL top prospects game. Obviously, Connor Bedard, a big factor there. We're also going to talk a bit today about the Hobie Baker race. Really interesting kind of dynamic to this year's Hobie Baker race and run. And there's a lot of players that are kind of in the mix, but it's mostly forwards. And we've got to talk about, you know, exactly what that Hobie Baker committee is going to have to vote on. Um, To also talk a little bit about the USHL today. And of course, as always, I will answer your questions. Before we get to all that, I want to remind you, Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet. You can do it on a variety of different platforms, including now YouTube. So subscribe to the Flow Hockey YouTube channel, and you'll be able to get every episode of Talking Hockey Sense. That way, of course, we're also available wherever you get your podcasts and on flowhockey.tv and the Flow Sports app. Also, if you're there, just, you know, as a nice favor to be cool, um, please leave a written review. Leave a, leave a kind rating as well. We're doing a lot of uh, growth of the podcast here. We're trying to get more listeners. And if you can help us out by providing those things, it does it does help. It really does. I mean it. It moves us up in the, in the charts and everything else, and more people can see Talking Hockey Sense. And if you are a fan of prospects and you think this is a, a good part of, of your prospect education slash research slash whatever, uh, please do leave a kind rating and review and as well. Check us out on both Flow Hockey and on YouTube. All right, so as I mentioned, going to be heading to Langley, British Columbia, just outside of Vancouver, the home of the Vancouver Giants, where the Kubota CHL Top Prospects game will be held. And of course, it's a doozy. And really, really excited to go check it out because you've got Connor Bedard. It's a big year for the WHL in general. Zach Benson is going to be there. He is now second in WHL scoring, just surpassed Andrew Crystal, who unfortunately won't be there because of injury. Um, but, you know, you've got some really good WHL players. You know, we, we're waiting to see. It looks like the, you know, the CHL defenseman this year, it hasn't been the strongest crop, but there are enough guys there where you say, okay, let's see what they're going to do. Let's see if they can step up a little bit. Um, you've got one of the top goaltenders for the draft this year, Car- Carson Bjarnason there. Uh, from the Brandon Wheat Kings. He'll be part of this this game as well. And so it's going to be fascinating to watch. Obviously, all eyes are going to be on Connor Bedard. It's his homecoming. It's his opportunity to play on the big stage in front of uh, you know friends and family, of course, as, as a North Vancouver native, not far from home um, there in Langley. And that's probably a big reason why this game is in Langley, so that we could have the Connor Bedard show. And boy, has he ever continued to put on a show this season just continues scoring at an alarming rate and it just doesn't look like anybody's going to come close to catching him for the number one pick in this year's draft and now he'll have another opportunity among the many he's had this season to really showcase his talent among his peers so one of the things that happens every single year there's a top prospects game a a big question i get asked a lot and a big question that i think i even had for a long time was do these games matter? Are they helpful? In some ways they are. They can absolutely be a little harmful to the process for the NHL team side. It's not going to be harmful to me. I'm just one guy with an opinion. The NHL team side, the interesting thing about top prospects games is that that's when the GMs go. You know, they, they, they do try to, a lot of GMs do try to get out and watch players, especially when it gets closer to the draft and they're a team with, with a high pick. You're going to see those general managers out and about at the rinks doing some of their own scouting. But a lot of them can't really get out. They have other things to do, especially now. This is pre-trade deadline, so there's still a lot of work happening behind the scenes to make NHL teams better. But this is kind of the the, the fun thing that that you know general managers are like, okay, this gets breaks it up a little bit. I'm gonna go watch some prospects, and they're gonna get a chance to see, you know, 40-ish players that they're you know, for the first time for some of them. And 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 in some of these players, that's the only time an NHL general manager is going to see them. And the general manager often is going to delegate to their scouting staff to allow them to say, hey, you guys set the list. You guys know 
they're going to push back on certain things there you know some general managers are much more involved than others in the amateur scouting process but you know scouting directors and assistant gms and all you know you're getting large clumps of nhl staffs at these games so you always wonder you know and it's the same thing with international tournaments too like the under 18 world championship you know, the, a lot of GMs are going to go to that. They're going to go to, you know, the various international tournaments. And that's really just a snapshot of those players. And so maybe somebody has a good week. Maybe somebody has an awful week. And then all of a sudden that's stuck in the GM's head. And when they're saying, this is who we want to pick. And then that's the guy. Then maybe they decide not to do that. That's happened before for sure. Um, but I think that, you know, for me and for you, the fans, the top prospects games are very valuable in that they are a bit of a clearinghouse to allow you to see many top players in the same setting with the same parameters around them you know with basically it's not really a vacuum but it is it is a kind of a controlled environment where you are going to get to see the very best players against each other and with each other and on the same ice sheet. So it's really good for comparing and contrasting things like skating, things like hockey sense, decision-making. This game moves pretty fast. Um, it's not always the cleanest game. Last year's game was pretty rough, actually. Um, not, a, not a great top prospects game, but I've been to a few where it's been really helpful and just, just allowing you to see, you know, if I'm looking at Lucas Dravisevic and, and Oliver Bonk, and I want to see, you know, how they move, how they make decisions, how they, and I want to see them in the same ice surface. This is going to be the only opportunity I likely have to do that. So that's helpful in that regard. You can't read too much into that. You have to rely on the rest of the work that you've done. But when you see them on the same ice surface, it allows you to compare and contrast a little bit more closely. Uh, but again, it's just one data point in the entire decision process which has a lot of different things. Like, you know, basically for me, I'm going to want to try to see each player that I'm going to rank. And it doesn't always happen this way, but especially for the guys that I think are going to be first round or the top 50 for me, I want to see them seven to eight times, whether it's on video, whether it's live, combining whatever I have to do to see these players seven to eight times. That's, a, you know, a lot of people have said that's kind of the sweet spot of, of where you want to see them. Sometimes I'll, you know, there, there are teams that are closer to me, so I'll see them more. Um, sometimes that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. But I think the top prospects games in general are a great little snapshot of what we do. The other thing that I really love about the CHL top prospects game is that they do this on-ice testing component, which we don't get at the NHL scouting combine, but we do get it at these top prospect games. That's where I'm really fascinated to watch these players because you get a good sense of their movement, their competitiveness, they're, you know, the different things that, the, you know, if they're taking it seriously because they should be because these are numbers that get sent to NHL teams, you know, those are really good things. And so you get to see things like reaction time, skating, um, you know, skating with and without the puck. It's always fascinating to me to see skaters that are faster with the puck than they are without it. It actually is true. You ever hear scouts say that? They say, well, you know what? The thing about him is he skates faster with the puck than without it. It is a real thing. And they actually test that at the CHL Top Prospects game. So that'll be my Tuesday. I'll be at the arena watching that. And even though I don't get the full breakdown of numbers, I'm getting a chance to see these players, how they move and different things. So I, I do think that is helpful. I really enjoy going to It's one of my favorite things of the entire week. I didn't get a chance to do it last year. This year I'll be there. So I'm really excited to see that because um, I've always found, you know, you just even, even in practice too, they'll do shootouts and you just see different skills with all these guys on the same ice surface together. So that's where I see the value. This year, unfortunately, we're going to have a couple of guys that aren't, aren't going to be able to play. Andrew Crystal, uh, Quentin Musty, Samuel Hanzek, all out for the game. They're all injured. They're unable to participate. Crystal being the one that I find you know most disappointing because he's a guy that's kind of a polarizing prospect. We've talked about him on this podcast before. You know, he's 5'10", you know, about 160, 170 pounds, somewhere in there. He's not a very big guy, but, you know, he's putting up points with just incredible regularity this year. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is his skating is a little bit not, it's not quite great. It's not, it doesn't bother me a ton. It's not something that I, you know, think is going to knock him completely out of it. But there are people that believe he is a first round pick and there are absolutely people that believe he's not. And when you see his numbers and you say, how is a guy like with numbers like that, not a first round prospect. I think, you know, 
moments like these to see him with his peers and see how he stacks up, that's where, you know, you can start kind of maybe taking a little bit of, you know, either chipping away at it or, or maybe it feeds into the, the narrative that he's not as, um, you know, maybe not, a, not at that level as guys like Zach Benson, Braden Yeager, um, you know, the other guys that we've talked about that are going to be a little bit further ahead of him in the draft. Um, you know, Quentin Musty is another guy that I think a lot of people are, are, are fascinated by what he's done this year with Sudbury. He has been uh, an absolute, you know, a scoring, uh, a scoring threat. He's got a great shot. You know, he's, he's got some skill. He's got some good decision making. He's not an amazing skater, which is, again, you, we talk about this a lot. You know, he's got the size. He's got strength. He's got a lot of different things that you like. The skating does hold him back a little bit. And so, you know, seeing him in, a, in an event like this. And then unfortunately, Samuel Hanzik got injured. Uh, this, this would have been his home game as well. Um, so uh, unfortunate not to see him there. Uh, but, you know, th- these these players that are injured, it's not, you know, the fact they're missing the top prospects game is not going to hurt their stock. It's not going to help their stock. It's probably, you know, negligible at best. But it's, you know, it's just one less opportunity. I get to see them live in this particular setting. So that's one thing. Uh, but, you know, obviously I've been watching video on these guys, have a lot, uh, you know, feel like a good feel for them. It would have been nice to see them in person at this thing. And hopefully I'll have other opportunities down the line. Um, you know, I think the other thing, too, that's fascinating about the top prospects game is, is you know, there are a lot of players that are going to come into this and, and they're going to have something to prove. Um, there are guys that maybe weren't ranked very highly by central scouting. There are other guys that, you know, feel like they're being overlooked. And maybe that is true. Um, but, you know, I think that when you go into a top prospects game, you have a chance, you know, some players will try to do too much and then that's a real turnoff. Some players won't uh, kind of get lost in the mix. And then, you know, the guys that, that that have the most success are the guys that just play the way that they always do, that play hard, that play fast. You know, sometimes you'll see you know, guys that are that are top level prospects, the, the number one guys. You're like, we fully expect Connor Bedard to do some special things in this game. Um, you know, we, we fully expect to see guys like Zach Benson make their impact felt in this game. Uh, but there's a lot of guys that have a lot to prove. And, you know, one of the guys that I'm thinking of is, you know, we've talked about him on this podcast before and I've talked about him in other settings is Cameron Allen uh, from the Guelph storm. You know, he was a, it was a fantastic season last year uh, in the OHL and that he came into this year with a lot of hype. He was the captain of the Holinka team. He was, you know, do, did, had a good tournament there, but over the course of this season, his draft stock has fallen precipitously and it's fallen, you know, to the point where it's looking very likely that he's not going to be a first round draft prospect, you know? So, I'll be fascinated to watch him as he develops, as he gets into this kind of game, as, as, as he goes along, because guys like him have a real opportunity to remind people of why they thought so highly of them in the first place. And, you know, Guelph has had a tough season. It's hard for him to stand out. Um, you know, I have seen him live this year and, you know, it, it, he's, he's got a lot of tools. We're just waiting to see. And so, you know, there's not a, I can't say there's a lot riding on the top prospects game for him. There really shouldn't be for anybody, but he's one of those guys where it's just like, Hey, put your hand up, show people that you're, you know, you're still the guy um, that, that we thought you were before. And even if you're not that you're better, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) excuse me, uh, that you're better than you have played this season. So I I think that Cam Allen's a guy that I'm I'm really looking forward to see in this particular setting after having seen him and seeing what he can do. Um, you know, the other interesting element of this game is going to be watching the defensemen, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Watching guys like Oliver Bort, or Bonk, uh, it, Lucas Lucas Dragasevic, you know, Cam Allen, um, yeah, Etienne Moran, you know, different players that are on the radar and in the mix for you know, first round candidacy. I think Oliver Bonk has put himself well into that discussion of, of course, the son of Radic Bonk playing for the London Knights. It was the subject of some trade rumors, didn't get moved by London. Um, and ultimately, you know, he's having a having a phenomenal season. Lucas Dragasevic, his points are, are out of control right now. You know, he's, he's, he's had a high scoring season. Um, got to see him last year at the Under-18 World Championship. Didn't really pop there. He was one of the youngest players on Team Canada. But now this season, he's taken a step. Um, you know, Etienne Moran is, is gotten a lot of attention. There are some people that absolutely think he could be in the first round and, and in that discussion 
Uh, but there are a lot more players, you know, the guys that, that you want to see and, and see what they can do. But uh, going to be a lot of fun to, to kind of watch that group. And then lastly, you know, it's a tough goal, a tough game for goalies to stand out in specifically. Uh, but it's just in the end, it's just a junior hockey game. So when you have a guy like Carson Bjardison, who's only going to play half the game, you know, he gets an opportunity to start. He gets a chance to get into his rhythm and he has a good, good start. You know, that's just another reminder as well. His numbers have taken a bit of a dip late, you know, as the season has progressed after starting really hot. But Central Scouting still had him as the number one goalie in North America. For me, he's been uh, hovering, you know, number two, number three for me um, in terms of where I think he'll be in the draft uh, among goaltenders. Uh, but he's another guy that I'm looking forward to seeing at this event. All right. I'm going to move on to uh, less things, uh, less things about junior hockey, more back to the college hockey. I haven't had a chance to talk as much college hockey on the podcast, uh, but do want to talk about it because I've been tracking the Hobie Baker race. And for a lot of this season, at least at the early stages, look like Adam Fantilli had a chance to run away with the thing. And, you know, what a, what a story that would be is he is the, um, you know, he's the young, the young, one of the younger players in college hockey. He's got a chance to be uh, a top three pick in this NHL draft, uh, possibly top two. And he's been outstanding when he's been healthy. And he did miss one weekend for illness and then another weekend for going to Team Canada's camp uh, for the World Junior Championship. So he's played fewer games, uh, but that means that he's also, you know, if you, if you judge him, um, he's still very much a candidate for this award. But the thing is, is that the way the season is setting up right now is that, you know, the, the Hobie Baker committee often um, likes to lean towards upperclassmen. However, there have been a lot of guys that are freshmen and sophomores that have been taking the NCAA by storm. The leading scorer in college hockey right now is Ryan McAllister from Western Michigan. He's been the leading scorer for some time now. Um, he has 40 points in 26 games, 1.54 points per game. Um, he is, is leading the nation with 29 assists. And, you know, he's, he's had just a tremendous season. He's also playing in the NCHC, which is one of the tough conferences in the country. And to see what he's doing, continuing to have consistent scoring, that's pretty impressive. Now, he is a freshman. He is a 21-year-old freshman, so he's not a true freshman. Uh, but again, it's hard for for freshmen to win this award, whether they whether or not they are, you know, a true freshman or not. Um, you know, we look back at, at at Kyle Connor as a freshman not winning. Um, you know, we look back at, at Jack Eichel did win, um, kind of ran away with the thing. So will Ryan McAllister have it on a shot? Well, I think he does. But the reason that his candidacy is a, is impacted somewhat negatively is that he's got a couple of teammates in the top five in uh, national scoring or in the top 10 in national scoring and including the number three scorer in the country and the leading goal scorer in the nation, Jason Poland. Now, Jason Poland is a senior. He has 36 points this season. 23 of those are goals. And so he's at 1.42 points per game. So Jason Poland absolutely um, in the mix and that could split the vote. That creates an opening. When you have two guys in the same team, it's really difficult for one of them to win unless the other one is is so far ahead. So I don't know exactly if Western Michigan's dynamic duo of McAllister and Poland are going to end up winning the Hobie Baker. They're absolutely in the mix. They need to be on the watch list. They need to be on everything else. And as you probably saw last week, nominations were out for the Hobie Baker. Now the nomination, being nominated for the Hobie Baker, it's a, it's a great way to get news stories. It's a great way to show, but every school gets to nominate somebody there's a lot of different players that'll be nominated. Fans can vote on it. It doesn't matter. But, you know, it's 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 fun to get the fans engaged, but you're uh, voting for your favorite player for the Hobie Baker isn't really going to do anything. Just just so you know. Uh just a little bit of uh but 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 those, you know, we we've, we've reached that stage of the season where the Hobie Baker nominations are out. So it makes it a little bit more immediate to have to talk about this, but so, so we've talked about McAllister and Poland, and I think that both of them are phenomenal players. Western Michigan, you know, they have a chance to go on a real run here. They haven't necessarily had the goaltending that's going to get them through, but they've been able to outscore their problems this year. It's, it's just they have the number one offense in the country. They have, you know, as I mentioned, three players in the top ten in national scoring. You got Max Sasson, uh, also Sasson, also in there, a sophomore with a, with thirty one points so far this season. So, you know, Western is really pushing and. To win the Hobie Baker, you can't 
you usually have to be on one of the better teams. And Western is a ranked team. They're a team that has a chance, real aspirations for the national tournament. You know, that's going to help their cause. So now the question is, when you look at the points per game in the country, Adam Fantilli, who's played in 20 games, and Ryan McAllister has played in 26. So 20 games for, for Adam Fantilli. 33 points, 14 goals, 19 assists. He had a great weekend against the University of Minnesota last weekend. Phenomenal series. If you didn't get a chance to see what happened, two games going to overtime in a series split. This That series is what college hockey is all about. Mariucci was rocking. The fans, the student section was going. It was great hockey, great skill, amazing prospects. I mean, just a tremendous exhibition of hockey talent in that series between Minnesota and Michigan. Wish I was there because it just looked phenomenal in terms of atmosphere. But but Adam Fantilli had a very nice weekend there. Now he has 1.65 points per game, which leads the country in points per game. He's a freshman. He's played fewer games. You know, he's missed a total of four games so far for either illness or, or being with Team Canada. Will that hurt his candidacy? I don't think it should. I personally think he's the best player in the country. Um, I also think that he's going to be, you know, one of the most impactful players. And he'll be a big reason that Michigan, if they do go on a run, goes on a run. But they're going to have to be a good team on top of him having the season that he's having, um, especially with the missed games. Another player that I want to spotlight because of points per game is Sean Farrell. He's played in 19 games this season. Now, Harvard, as you know, probably Ivy League teams start their season late. They have a pretty loaded back half of the schedule. So we're going to see exactly where Sean Farrell is going to go. He's a Montreal Canadiens draft pick. He's technically a junior. And he has 29 points in 19 games, 1.53 points per game. That's just 0.01 fewer points per game than Ryan McAllister. So Sean Farrell, despite not having the raw points, absolutely has to be in this Hobie Baker mix. He is driving a team that is ranked. He's got a team that is, you know, they're, they're a really solid offensive team, and he's the leader of it. Um, so I think that that's going to be another factor is that, sh that Sean Farrell is going to figure prominently in this Hobie Baker race. Meanwhile, you've got a lot of other things going on. So Austin Swankler is from Bowling Green State. He has points in 18 consecutive games. He is the second leading scorer in the country in terms of raw points with 38 points in 27 games for Bowling Green. The Falcons have been one of the better teams in the CCHA this year. They're absolutely in the mix for getting into the, the tournament. They're going to they're gonna need some help. They're going to have to win, likely win the CCHA to get in. They don't have as good a resume necessarily as some of the other teams, and, and their pairwise ranking isn't as uh, solid. But Austin Swankler, and Swankler's kind of one of those real interesting players in, in college hockey because he, he's in his second season, but he actually played the Ontario Hockey League. And so that COVID year that paused the OHL, he took a year off of hockey, was able to petition and get college eligibility again. Um, he also played in the USHL, he was a really good USHL player. He was kind of in the mix for, for multiple, um, you know, like uh, at, the, at the player development camps that USA Hockey has every year. He's always a, a top performer. Well, this year he's got 38 points in 27 games, and all of a sudden you're saying, wow, this is, you know, he's a, technically a sophomore. You know, he's an old sophomore, and he is absolutely lighting it up this season. So uh, we'll be fascinating to see. It's always tougher. You know, last year we had a Hobie Baker winner from the CCHA, Dryden McKay. Um, it's been tougher for forwards in the CCHA and Atlantic Hockey to win the Hobie Baker. And it's, you know, strength of schedule is absolutely going to be factored in, and that's going to be something that may hurt Austin Swinkler's candidacy ultimately. But that's a guy to keep an eye on because he's he's just been remarkably consistent. Points in 18 consecutive games for the Falcons. Great to see. Some other names to keep in mind. Matt Brown, leading scorer for Boston University. The Terriers have been outstanding this season. He has 34 points in 23 games. He is also a senior. Colin Graff from Quinnipiac, which uh, uh, lost this weekend for the first time. You know They, they hadn't lost since October. Uh, managed to to lose a couple of games here, but Colin Graff is their leading scorer with 34 points in 24 games. Uh, Massimo Rizzo from Denver is their leading scorer, and that's another name to keep in mind. And then also keep in mind 
Logan Cooley and Jimmy Snuggerud, a couple of freshmen that are leading the offensive charge for Minnesota, which has been one of the best teams in college hockey all season long. Got a lot of time for them. They are tied at the top of the, the scoring leaderboard for the Gophers with 31 points apiece. Um, Snuggerud has played in one more game than Cooley, and so Cooley has the slightly higher points per game average. The other interesting thing about the Hobie this year, we've had some really good goaltending performances the last couple of years that, that put guys into the mix for the Hobie. Dryden McKay, a goaltender, won last season. Not going to happen this year. There is not a goalie that's having that, that, that year where it's just like undeniable. You have to give them the Hobie Baker. Um, and so that it's really difficult for goaltenders to win this award. And this year, I just don't see any goalie that's going to come close to, to being, you know, I don't even know if we'll have any in the top 10. Maybe we will. Um, the official top 10, that is, when the Hobie committee announces that uh, later in the season. Um, but it's going to be really hard for that. Also, defensemen. You look at the national scoring leaderboard. Normally, we'd have a couple of defensemen up there. You have to go quite a ways down um, to, you know, tied for 15th at this point, Lane Hudson with 27 points in 22 games at 1.23 points per game. The reason I wanted to bring that up is because I've talked about it before. Lane Hudson is having one of the best seasons for a, 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 an 18 year old freshman defenseman in, in NCAA hockey history. I mean, 1.23 points per game. That's he's on a pace similar to what Luke Hughes had when he was a Hobie top 10 last season. Um, it'll be interesting to see how, how they manage that because Hudson also has Matt Brown, who's one of the top scorers or is the top scorer for, for Boston University, how does that impact his candidacy? But I did want to mention him and also mention uh, Jackson Lacombe, who uh, is another one of the top scoring defensemen in the country. Um, he has a close to a point per game and has been a real impactful player for the University of Minnesota. So the Hobie race, wide open still. Um, obviously, McAllister and Poland from Western Michigan have a real good opportunity here. I think you look in the next kind of the next wave, I think Fantilli has to be in the mix. Um, based on what he's done this season and has to be uh, a, a real candidate. If Michigan goes on a run, watch out, because then all of a sudden you've got a chance to, to have a Hobie Baker winner that's draft eligible, just like we had when Jack Eichel was draft eligible and won the Hobie. All right, we're moving on to the USHL next. And I wanted to, this is more of a programming note, because I wanted to let you know, you know, full hockey, we have every single USHL game um, uh, from uh Everything except for the, the NTDP home games. We've got all those games for you there. So you're going to be able to, to see those games and see these players a lot. But we've also been trying to work on a lot of shoulder content and trying to bring you more coverage of the USHL. It's a phenomenal league. It's been undercovered for a long time. We're trying to fix that a little bit. And we, uh, we did have Jordan McAlpine. Jordan moved on to uh, the rink live. Really happy for him to, to get a position there. More coverage of hockey is a great thing. Uh, but we are. Uh, with Jordan leaving, we're going to have Ryan Sykes coming in. And Ryan Sykes, you can follow him on Twitter at Ryan underscore Sykes 10. That's S I K E S one zero. Um, and Ryan uh, just started this week. And the thing I like about Ryan is that he's took, taken some initiative and basically he started his own USHL site. And I was looking at the content on there. I was looking at the videos that he was putting up and I was like, this guy really knows what he's doing. He knows the league. He understands the, the, the way things work, and I really like the story instincts. So I'm really pleased to have Ryan Sykes with us at Flow Hockey covering the USHL. Part of Ryan's duties also, he's going to be compiling a, a highlight tape every single week of the top goals from the week before. So every Monday, you're going to be able to see the top plays from the USHL, and there were some really good ones this week. So you can check, catch that on Flow Hockey. You'll also be able to find it on our social channels. It's on Instagram right now. But also follow Ryan Sykes because he has been doing a really good job throughout the season as an independent writer. Couldn't be happier to have him at Flow Hockey. So make sure you're following him. He's got some great insight into the league. Beyond that, I also wanted to talk about this last weekend in the USHL was absolutely phenomenal. Um, we had some really great games. And you know I've been watching a lot of the players, obviously watching for the draft, but also watching for just the sake of, of the league and seeing seeing what's happening. And this weekend just had so much going on. There was a great game between Chicago and Waterloo where Chicago had the game in hand. It looked like they were going to run away with it. They had a 4-1 lead going into the third period. They end up losing 5-4, to four, a furious comeback by the Waterloo Blackhawks. They score three goals in the last minute 40, and they are able to skate off with a 5-4 win over Chicago. 
That had stretched Waterloo's winning streak to seven games. The next night, however, a late game-winning goal from Ryan St. Louis of the Dubuque Fighting Saints. That thwarts the winning streak of Waterloo. Just one day later, they get stunned by a late goal. Um, and both of the, the, the game-winning goal for Waterloo against Chicago and the game-winning goal for Dubuque against uh, Waterloo are on our USHL Plays of the Week. Make sure you check those out. But just fascinating. Another player that's on our Goals of the Week is Macklin Celebrini. Now, we've been talking about Macklin Celebrini throughout the season because he's the top 16-year-old in the USHL this season. 2006-born Canadian player, son of uh, Rick Celebrini, who is a, an, uh, the head of sports performance for the Golden State Warriors. So, you know, Macklin Celebrini has been, we've, we've been talking about him for, for years, uh, those that have kind of seen him play and, and seen what he did at Shattuck St. Mary's and then seeing him this season. He's currently second in the USHL. As we record this, second in the USHL in scoring with 41 points at 16 years old. Um, he is leading the league outside, with, with the exception of two players from the NCDP's under-18 team who have played far fewer games. Macklin Celebrini has a 1.52 points per game average for the Chicago Steel. That is tops in the league outside of the of Gabe Perot and Will Smith who play at the National Team Development Program. So what we're seeing from Macklin Celebrini this season is something very special, and I don't want that to be lost on anybody. Producing in the USHL is incredibly difficult. It's even more difficult when you're a young player, but Celebrini has shown that he's got maturity um, in his game. He's got physical strength. He has tremendous finish and unbelievable hockey sense. And to see a young guy come into the league and play as well as he has throughout the season, yes, he's got a great supporting cast. Chicago has put him in a, in a position to succeed. They have a lot of players. They have you know Michael Emerson, who's a, a draft re-entry, who's the leading scorer in the league right now. They have you know they have Jaden Perron. They have uh, Nick Molden now, or they just added Quinn Finley in a trade. So they've got a highly skilled team. But for a 16-year-old to do what Macklin Celebrini is doing in the USHL, it just doesn't happen very often. And so I wanted to make sure that we pointed that out because you can watch him every single day, uh, every single Chicago Steel game. You can watch him on flow hockey and you have to see him because I think that he is going to be a very special player fully expected to go to Boston university next year, accelerating. He'll be the youngest player in college hockey. He will also likely be a strong, if not the top candidate for the number one overall pick at next year's draft. All right. We're going to move on to questions and answers and all of the questions I got last week, right after we recorded. And so instead of putting out a call for new questions, I wanted to make sure we got to everybody that asked a question last week. And so I had to go back and look at my mentions and we picked out uh, the, the questions that I wasn't able to get to. We've got NHL draft questions. We've got some NHL player questions. We've got some other uh, fascinating questions from our listeners. And we will start, this is a DM, so you're not gonna see it on the screen, uh, but this was a, a DM that I got last week that I thought was interesting. Out of your first round rankings, which centers are projected to play in the middle at the next level? Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli, Luke, uh, Leo Carlson, Braden Yeager, Will Smith, Callum Ritchie, Dalibor Dvorsky, Charlie Stramel, Oliver Moore, Gavin Brindley. All right. That's going to be the interesting thing about this draft class is that there are a lot of guys that I think could potentially play on the wing, including Connor Bedard. It's not a given. I think it's probably, it's getting more and more likely that he's just going to be a center at the NHL level over time. But I think that when you have such a, a tremendous scoring tool like Bedard does, teams are going to consider putting him on the wing. And I would bet a lot that he's going to start on the wing at the NHL no matter what, and they'll see how that goes. And if they feel like they need to move him to the middle, they'll figure it out. Keep in mind, at the World Junior Championship, Connor Bedard was on the wing. He had a, a record-setting performance. Is that the best place for him? We'll have to wait and see. But I, I think he can play center, but I do think that it's more likely that he ends up um, on the wing. Adam Fantilli is a center to me. Uh, he's got the size. He's got the physicality. He's got the defensive sense. Um, he's got everything that you want, and that's why he's a high, high draft pick. Leo Carlson, my concern with him being a center is the skating ability. I don't necessarily think that he has the the pace to play center effectively at the NHL level. I think you can hide it a little bit more when the player's in the wing. He has the size, he has the strength, he has a lot of those, you know, he has a lot of the instincts of a center. I still think 
It's more, I, I feel more comfortable with him on the wing, especially because of the pace thing. Braden Yeager, he's kind of one of those guys that I think could go either way. Um, I like him in the middle. I think that he can play wing and be a more productive player. He's not, you know, a, a massive guy. You know, he's, he's got, he's average size, you know, so it's not, not like that's going to be the issue. His skating is okay. You know, he, I, I think he's kind of one of those guys that can go really either way. Will Smith to me is a center. I think in the same way that Trevor Zegers is a center. I've talked about that before. Um, you know, he's, he's a guy that I think needs to have the puck a lot and needs to be dictating the pace. I do think that he can be a driver for this team uh, or, or any team that drafts him. So I do think that Will Smith has the, the long-term projection as a center. I definitely have talked to scouts that see him more as a wing. I personally see him as a center. I think he needs to have the puck a lot to have success, and he'll have it more as a center. Um, Callum Ritchie, uh, I think he can kind of go either way as well. Uh, Dalibor Dvorsky, I think long-term is going to be a center. I think that he's got the the instincts. His defensive skills are very strong already. Um, he's got a real maturity to his game. He's got decent enough size. Um, Charlie Stramel, I think he's another one that's kind of a tweener. Um, I love the way that he played down the middle when he was there uh, at the the World Junior Championship. I've liked him at Wisconsin for various games. Not every game. Uh, most, you know, he's had a, a tough go there. But I do think that that uh, that Charlie Stramel has a real good opportunity to be a center. Oliver Moore. A big reason why his draft stock is shooting up is because not only is he a center, he's a guy that I think a lot of teams could see pl- playing right in the middle of their lineup and being a guy that gets tough matchups. That also is going to give you some goals. He's one of the fastest players in this draft coming up. He may be the fastest player. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say it. He's the fastest player in this draft based on all the players that I've seen. Um, and he's, he's incredible. Uh, and, and so I do think that he is a center. The thing that I love about Oliver Moore, and I've said this before, is that he's, he's taken it upon himself to really get stronger. And that has made him a much better player, a much more effective player. And so I do think he's going to be a center. Gavin Brindley, I see as a wing. I don't think the size is going to be there for him. He's got the pace. He's got the tenacity. Uh, but I do think that he will ultimately be on the wing. So just to run down the list that you gave me. Um, but I mean, the thing is, is that you draft a lot of, a lot of centers are drafted and a lot of them end up on the wing. It's just the way it goes. Um, last year, we kind of had the reverse with Cutter Goche, who played wing all season. It was drafted basically because they thought he could be a center and he can be and has been a good one for Boston College this year. So there's that. All right. Our next question comes from uh, the Big Tortilla. And he asks, Loved hearing you on the PHNX Coyotes podcast last week. You briefly mentioned Braden Yeager. Do you see him as a center in the NHL? And what are some of his weaknesses he needs to work on? Thank you. Well, you know, Braden Yeager, we just talked about him a little bit. You know, I think he can be a center at the NHL level. Um, he's he's a really good player. He's having a good season with Moose Jaw. Um, he's, the thing I like about Yeager is that he understands how to play with really good players. He's been around, um, you know, good players in the uh, – in in the WHL, in Moose Jaw, and that has allowed him to have some success. The things that are holding him back, he needs to get physically stronger. That's, you know, a lot. That's going to be the the case for so many players that we talk about. But that's really the thing that I think we need to see most from him. Um, You know, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the question becomes, can he still produce at the offensive level from the center position when he gets to the NHL? Does he have you know the strength or the, the the versatility to do more things than just score? Um, and I, I think he does. You know, I think he's kind of, but he, again, he's one of those guys where I I couldn't tell you right now that I that I feel very confident that he's hundred percent a center at the NHL level. Um, you know, off puck plays fine. Um, you know, I just think that the offensive things that he does are 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 much more potent. Um, and that's why maybe you you want to put him on the wing. Uh, but I think it's a good question. And, and he's a guy I, I got to continue to track and just kind of get a better feel for in terms of, you know, that that question of, of you know, where ultimately he slots in. I've always liked Braden Yeager. I think that he's a player that, you know, is very much still in the mix for a top 10 pick. Um, I don't think he's going to go as high as we initially thought he would this season. You know, so I do think that he's going to kind of be there in that that second. He's He's kind of back in that second tier, maybe third tier of this draft class. Um, and, you know, of the first round prospects, because I think, you know, tier one is Connor Bedard, tier two is a bunch of other guys. And I, I'm not sure that I would put Braden Yeager in that next tier with the guys like Mitchkov and Carlson, 
um, Fantilli and all that. So, um, so that's, uh, that's how I feel about that one. All right. Our next question comes from Patrick La Rochelle and he says, Hey, Chris, do you think the USHL and CHL should organize a playoffs championship between the Clark Cup and Memorial Cup champions? That could be as interesting, especially the U CHL and USHL are the best junior leagues in North America. Cheers from Montreal. Well, Patrick, thank you for the question. Um, and this is something that's brought up often, you know, these, these ideas of, of having the Memorial Cup champion play the Clark Cup champion. Um, you know, there are a couple of reasons why I don't necessarily think that's the right way to go about this. There's also been a lot of talk of saying, hey, why don't we put a USHL team in the Memorial Cup? Well, here's the thing. The Memorial Cup is the national championship of the Canadian Hockey League. And so that I, I don't I've never thought that the USHL should be involved in the Memorial Cup. It'd be fun. You know, but I do think that the, the tradition of of the Canadian teams playing for their national championship, um, which is essentially what the Memorial Cup is, should remain intact. Um, the other thing that I would say about, you know, I, I like the idea, but I already think, you know, one of the things the Memorial Cup is those teams battle all year, win a championship in their league, and then have to go win another one. Winning the championship in their league should really be, you know, a, a huge deal. Like, you know, in the USHL, you win the Clark Cup. That's it. You are the tier one national champion of USA Hockey. You are the Clark Cup champions of the USHL. You are, you know, you that's it. You did it. Um, and then in the, you know, the, the thing that's crazy to me is that you can win your league and then you could have the disappointment of, of getting bounced out of the Memorial Cup. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. The other thing that I would say is the le the season is already too long. Um, junior hockey seasons are are very long in general, and then you add the Memorial Cup on top of that. These players are basically playing into June or close to June, and then we've got you know the 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 combine. So I I just think it's too taxing on the players. I don't think that it, there's enough value in it to have that. What I would like to see um, is potentially something different like a preseason um meeting between teams now it doesn't necessarily have to be the champions of the leagues because their turnover in the rosters is so significant you wouldn't really have that but i i, I would like to see a little more cross-border play because i think that you know there is there is uh um you know there's a lot of different kind of conversations about you know who's the better league what's the better place i don't like to get into that because i think that the the thing is, is that these leagues serve their purpose remarkably well, which is to develop talent, to provide pipelines to both college hockey and the NHL. Um, if you're the CHL, specifically the NHL, and then U sports as well, they do what they're supposed to do. Um, and I don't necessarily think we need to have a, I don't think games between teams from these leagues are, are going to help us determine which league is better, um, because that's not ultimately what how success should be measured in junior hockey, at least not from a prospect analyst perspective. I, you know, my, my, my main focus is, is how things go, but I think it would be fascinating to see a little bit more, like get a few exhibitions between, you know, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, like an Owen sound Waterloo game, you know, like something like that. It would be crazy, you know, and, and we actually have had a few instances where CHL teams and USHL teams have played against each other at the junior club world cup. Um, I, I believe Waterloo may have played Sudbury. I'm not sure if that's the same year, but you know, there have been instances where teams have played in the Junior Club World Cup. Nobody uh, is going to that anymore, uh, as far as I know, um, at least not from North America. And so that's kind of that 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 helped kind of scratch the itch a little bit. But so to to break it all down after going on a bit of a rant, I don't think that the two champions should play, um, but I do think that we should try to find ways to get the CHL and the USHL to play a couple of games, just a, you know, an exhibition series or something like that. Nothing, you know, we want it to be competitive, but it doesn't have to be a referendum on either league, depending on the results of those games. But I, it's a good idea. And thanks for, thanks for the question, Patrick. All right. Our next one comes from Richard Cologne, and he asks, what can Keandre Miller do to make the next leap to all-star caliber player? Seems like he's improving each game. Well, if you have been watching any New York Rangers games lately, or if you've been watching the New York Rangers over the last couple of seasons, you can't miss DeAndre Miller. Um, you know, we—he's—he was one of my favorite prospects to track in his draft season. 
because the possibilities were endless with him. He was a player that didn't necessarily have everything put together in his U18 season. He had 29 points in 58 games. Not bad, but it's not an incredible uh, number. You know, he was he was fine at the World World Under 18 Championship. Didn't necessarily uh, light the world on fire there. Um, you know, he he had two okay World Juniors. Um, he had a good freshman season at Wisconsin. Took a bit of a step back as a sophomore, I thought. And then by the next season, he was in the NHL. He's never touched the American Hockey League. This season, he's already put up a career high in points of 25. He's got five goals, uh, career high 20 assists, and that's just in 46 games. So I think he's taking that step now. Um, I think that he's on the way. Now, will he necessarily be an all-star caliber player? I think he will, but the offensive numbers are going to have to come a little bit more. He's going to have to be a bit more of a consistent scorer. He's going to need opportunities to, to produce. I think that's really the only thing. The way that he has matured as a player, the quality of defense that he plays. We already knew he was a phenomenal skater. We knew that he had the physical strength to compete. We knew that he had the, you know, the, the, the intelligence to, to play at the NHL level. Now we're seeing him take those steps. So I think just be a little more patient because it's coming. Because you look at what he's doing right now, he's going to surpass, just shatter his previous career norms in terms of production. Um, he's one of my favorite players to watch still because I got to see where he started. You have to remember that Keandre Miller didn't start playing defense until he was in high school. Um, so he has not been a defenseman very long in his hockey life, but he made that transition and it changed the entire trajectory of his career. And now you look at the, the training that he got at the National Team Development Program at Wisconsin and now at the NHL level, this is a player that's on a rocket ship right now. And I think the best is yet to come for Keandre Miller. He is going to be a core piece of this New York Rangers roster for a long time to come, assuming they can pay him next time he's uh, – He's right. I think he's due for a contract soon. All right. Next question comes from Luke Anthony. And Luke asks, thoughts on Connor Geeky's season? He's progressed. Uh, has he progressed much from last year in any attributes despite similar offensive production? Well, you know, Connor Geeky's had an interesting season. And I think, you know, for him, I'm sure it was a, a bitter disappointment not to be part of um, Canada's World Junior roster. Um, you know, I think that a lot of us expected that maybe he would have a chance. Um, you know, I think that I personally was expecting a bigger step forward from him, especially playing on one of the best teams in junior hockey in the Winnipeg Ice. He's just over a point per game in the WHL. And for a player that's drafted at his level, you look at the WHL scoring right now, and most of the players that are leading the league in scoring are draft-eligible players. So guys like Connor Geeky, who have experience, who have age, who have size, who have all these things, you would expect a better level of production, but the things that we've seen from him, the skating still needs a lot of improvement, a lot of work. He he has the offensive instincts. I think his goal scoring has improved this season. I think he's shown an ability and a and a desire to get more pucks to the net. Um, but he still kind of, you know, I, I think with Connor Geeky, the concerns that I had about him, I, you know, I, I thought he was an intelligent player. I thought he was a great competitor. But he did a lot of things well, but you know the skating and just uh, sometimes you'd lose them in games. And you know, I, I actually saw him at the uh, at the rookie faceoff um, in in San Jose uh, this year, and seeing him play in that in that event, and you could tell at that point he needed to go back to junior. You need that he needed more time. Um, and I think if you're if you're a Coyotes fan, you just have to be patient. You know they, and that's what. You know, the Coyotes drafted him with some patience in mind. They knew it was going to be a little bit of a process. 11th overall, big-time pick. That's, a, you know, a, a high-level pick for a guy like that. But let's keep in mind, he's a six foot four center, you know, with, with strength. And, and, you know, I think ultimately he's not going to be a number one center. I don't think that was ever really in the projection for him. But, you know, he's probably going to be a solid two, maybe a three. Um, and... We'll have to wait and see, but I think that there's still more development ahead for Connor Geeky this season. All right. Our next question comes from 
Jackson. And Jackson asks for thoughts on Isaac Phillips. All right. Well, Isaac Phillips has had a, uh, a, you know, a good season. I mean, the fact that he is in the NHL, he's had some NHL games under his belt with the Chicago Blackhawks. I think he's a guy that has progressed far quickly, far more quickly uh, than I thought he would, you know, coming out of junior, you know, having the opportunity to play in Rockford and get some of that development. You know, I really do think that he is um, a great success story for the value that the AHL provides players after their junior careers, because, you know, he's, he wasn't a big producer in the OHL. He didn't have a ton of points, but he had size, he has strength and, you know, he defends well and he's having a really great season in Rockford. I think that that's probably, you know, I'd prefer if I'm the Blackhawks, I'd prefer that he play more of the season in Rockford, get to that level where you are um, a more dominant player, a more well-rounded player. But, you know, you can't just look at the production. I mean, he's, he's played in the NHL this season. He's got four points in NHL games, including his first NHL goal, 17 points in the AHL this season. Um, you know, this is a guy that, you know, you look at, the at a draft pick that you got in the fifth round, 141st overall, you love the value that he's already provided your organization, because if you can even get AHL depth, uh, or, or, and a guy that can spot start in the NHL with a fifth round pick, you're, you're ecstatic. You just want a guy you can sign at that point and see where they go. But I think that Isaac Phillips is continually every single season going back to junior and now into his professional career. Every single season, he gets better. Is he going to be a star? No. Is he going to be you know, a, a valuable, everyday NHL player? I do think he can be that, and that's kind of where he's going right now. So as I almost knock over my mic here and uh, create a, a catastrophe of audio on this, on this here podcast. All right. Uh, next question is our last question. It comes from Dan Hogan, and Dan asks, the Wild have a ton of D prospects, but do you see any of them as top pairing guys? Where does David Spachek rank in that group after a strong World Junior Championship? So uh, he's right. There, there are quite a few solid young defensemen in the Minnesota Wild system. Um, you know, I think that of the guys that are potential top pairing defensemen, you know, I think that there's there's still hope that that could be Carson Lambos, uh, who of course was cut from the um, the Canadian World Junior team this year. A uh, bit of a surprise there as a returning player, um, but you know I think that that that's that's a that's probably one of the guys that you have to look at and say he's got a real good chance to to be you know a high end defenseman. Now I don't think they have that at this point. They don't have that you know that Moritz Sider, that Simon Edmondson, that Luke Hughes kind of style prospect. They have a lot of guys that are are kind of maybes. But David Spachek is a player that I think will absolutely play in the NHL. I think that he's going to play a long time in the NHL because he does a lot of little things well. And this year, he's also producing. You know, he's had 28 points, 34 games for the Sherbrooke Phoenix and the QMJHL. As you mentioned, he had that tremendous World Junior Championship where he was just phenomenal for Czechia and played big minutes and, and can do a little bit of everything. I think he defends well. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, you've got other guys. Uh, you know, Brock Faber is another one that, I have such immense respect for as a prospect and as a player. Um, you know, he's not a guy that produces at that high level, which makes it harder for me to see him as a number one or a top pairing um, lock. I do think that he's going to be a minutes eater at the NHL level. I think he's going to play in all situations, maybe not power play, but he's going to play, you know, PK. He's going to be one of your top guys at five on five. Um, I think he's got a, a great chance there. Jack Peart's another guy. I think, you know, probably bottom of the lineup NHL defenseman for me. Um, you know, uh, other guys like Ryan Healy's really interesting, a very good skater. He's, hit, he's, he's had a couple of good weeks at Harvard. I think he's a long way away. Um, uh, and then you've got, you know, Damon Hunt doing an op having a good opportunity uh, with the Iowa Wild to play, you know, some meaningful minutes there. Ryan O'Rourke as well. Um, haven't seen the production from those guys, but keep in mind they're young, professional, uh, you know, young in their professional careers, and they're going to continue to to make strides. But you look at that group and you look at all of them, you say, hey, we've got some legitimate NHL players in this in this mix here. Um, you know, we've got some guys that we think are going to play for our team down the line. And then you look at Faber, Lambos, and Spacek in particular. You say, hey, maybe these are guys that are going to be part of our top four in the future. Um, so really good job by 
uh, Minnesota in terms of their drafting and also getting favor in the trade. You know, I think that that Fiala trade, it hurt to, to lose a Kevin Fiala, but it, they got a really valuable piece in Brock Faber. And so I think that's a really strong thing to have. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the, the wild are, are going to be a fascinating team to watch. Um, you know, Bill Guerin, has been a general manager that's been extremely aggressive with the salary cap, and he's not been a shy of of you know burning some money uh, like he did with the buyouts of of Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter, and so that makes prospects and getting guys to matriculate on time all that much more important because you need them on those entry level contracts to help fill the void. Um, it's only a couple more years of those the, the dead cap space created by the Parisi and Suter buyouts, massive dead cap space. Um, and then you kind of move past that and you've got this young core that's kind of ready to take your team to the next level. So, um, you know, I think that the Wild are, are, are doing a really nice job at the NHL level and now at the, beneath the NHL level having options for them uh, down the road here and into the future. So great question, Dan, and great question, everybody. I really appreciate when you guys do ask those questions. Sorry I didn't get to them last week, so I decided to get to them this week. Hope that doesn't uh, uh, bother you that they were a little bit delayed, but happy to do it on the show. All right, well, that's pretty much going to do it for this week's episode. I'm really excited to uh, head out to Langley. Next week, we'll talk more about the CHL Top Prospects game, which is on Wednesday night. I probably should have said that during the other round. It's on uh, a Wednesday night. Um, and so we will be uh, following that, and I will have a lot of stories from the ground there in Langley. And as I mentioned, make sure you're following our USHL coverage. Follow Ryan Sykes at Ryan underscore Sykes 10. Um, and also... Check out all of the great streaming content on Flow Sports every single day. I mean, we got everything you could want on there uh, from, from, from wrestling to grappling to racing and, of course, hockey. There's so much to enjoy on Flow Sports. So I guess uh, it's time to sign off. And I just want to say thanks to Colt Joyce for producing this episode. Really appreciate the work he's been doing on this podcast. And also appreciate all of you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, like, rate, review, do all of that. And we will get back at you next week with a ton more prospect talk on Talking Hockey Sense. My name's Chris Peters. We'll catch you next week.